And so we have this selection calling out. By selection meaning he selects the timing of when he kind of taps your bubble and pops a hole in it and that kind of thing. Right? So you have the selection process. So that to me is what Passover and unleavened bread is about. This, this selection where he's getting your attention to wonder about who he is and what he is. Because Israel, although they were Israel, had been in captivity long enough that they, they really had lost sort of touch with who and what he is. And he had to demonstrate and, and readdress that you know, with them, right? To, so they would understand who and what he is. And that really is the same thing with you, isn't it, in your life? When he first started you know, sort of tapping you on the shoulder, popping your bubble and saying, you know what, you don't know me like you think you do. Maybe you were in the world and you didn't know him at all. Then they went through the metaphor picture of the watery death, okay? The baptism. They went through water. So in, in a sense, they were coming out to walk in newness of life. They were now separated from Egypt. They had gone through this journey. They were leaving that world and that life behind. These are all things that happened before you covenanted at Sinai. So for all of you thinking, well, I don't want to go in the baptism water. I don't want to go get mikvah until I know this, this, and this. They didn't have all that yet. They had one thing, a recognition that that old, old you needed to be buried. They recognized that the old them needed to be buried, and they were going to go starting, start a new life, and a, and a new life with a new authority in their life a different authority in their life, right? So they were going to have that. We did not, as Israel, necessarily, literally marry him at Sinai, but the picture is like a wedding. The picture is like a marriage relationship with us being the bride and him being the groom, okay? Which means that the relationship then pictures to us what it should look like in human terms. We should be as the grooms, the men, fully capable and desiring to provide everything for the bride, and the bride should fully trust and be submitted to in obedience to the man, knowing that that relationship works in that direction. So for whatever reason, Abba wants beings that he's going to have forever with, and he has things for us to do, believe me. We're going to get to that, I think, in a minute here, but... And so, but he doesn't have any interest in any kind of contention, division, rebellion. He doesn't want any of those negative emotional things that would cause a problem for his doing the things he wants to do. We already had the rebellion of the demons. He's not having any of that. So what does he do? He gives us a limited fleshly life in which we get to demonstrate that if he gave us, if he gave us eternal life, that he could trust us. If the whole point is providing for your family in some minimal way, at least, and, and keeping and obeying commandments, what is the motivation to strive to do more? Should we be motivated to produce more and accomplish more and create more? And the answer is, is yes, but why? Well, what do you think we're going to be doing? See, the church has really just messed you up, okay? Because they basically have you smiling and basking in the glory of the Messiah, strumming a harp on a cloud or some nonsense, okay? I don't even know why that entices anybody. Oh boy, make, sign me up. <laughs> that sounds like fun forever. <sighs> what, what, what's that? Why would he give you all of what he's given you just to sit there as a brain-dead, smiling zombie playing a harp staring at Messiah. But Abba wants to see your creativity. That creativity could be in relationships. That creativity could be in some sort of art. That creativity, in other words, what, think about what he's given you and what are you doing with it, all right? I don't want us to put some specific sort of measuring stick on this. He's got the measuring stick and he knows what he gave you. 
He's not expecting everybody here to go out there and be entrepreneurial businessmen, millionaires. That's not the talent that he gave everybody. He's not expecting everybody to write songs like my daughter does. That's the talent he gave her. But he gave you stuff. Okay? Some of you have tremendous compassion. Some of you are great listeners. Some of you are very generous with your time. Some of you are, are great in providing, I don't know, whatever. You just keep putting more and more stuff in there. And so trumpets, Yom Teruah is the waking up. Now it's interesting because your bubble got popped at Passover, so to speak, metaphorically, right? And you started going through this journey. But then all of a sudden we realize, this is what I think trumpets is about. We realize that this is real. There's a wake up after waking up. Because some of us are sleepwalking. So trumpets is the wake up call to like, hey, <laughs> this is real, stop playing with it. Wake up. And that has to do with listening and doing. And by the way, notice that this is happening, waking up, and that aligning with Yom Kippur, these are pre-millennial things. So this is for those who are of the first resurrection. This isn't for everybody. If you want to be, it says blessed are those in the first resurrection. If you want to be in the first resurrection? Trumpets is for you. Atonement is for you. Because it's getting you ready for the next final phases, which is the millennium and then the kingdom. And so, you know, Sukkot, you've got a thousand years to get everybody else ready. All of us in the first resurrection have already finished that process. Now we're just working for the boss, helping the rest get ready. Okay? And then, of course, you have Shemini Atzeret, the end of the process, which is the new heavens, the new earth, and the forever kingdom. You know, part of what happened in Mitzrayim was Abba showing Israel, this is who I am, okay? And by the way, he doesn't come off like in the Jesus movies as the long-haired, peace-love, hippie freak, okay? He's very strong. I am God and you are not, <laughs> okay? And don't mess with me. Don't play games with me. Don't claim I'm something I'm not. I mean, he's very, very personality style, very red, we'll call it, okay? In a, a lot of ways. This is it, I'm not playing games, okay? Now, very blue in that he's very detail-oriented, very white in that he wants peace above all, right? And he does have a sense of humor, we can see, so there's a lot of little yellow in there, too. When, this is important, when you search for him with all your heart, and with all your being. What does that mean with all your heart? It doesn't mean that you just want him badly, that you want him as he is, and you want what he has the way he has it, that you're not putting, you know, you're not boxing it into your own image. You're actually just seeking him. Whatever that is, I want it. And whatever it is, I'm going to submit to it. I'm going to relationship with it. I'm going to covenant, whatever. I'm, I don't know what it looks like. I've been out here in the wilderness. He scattered us. Now I, I'm aware of him now again. He's poked that little bubble and he's made me aware of him this much, right? Tiny little bit, he's made us aware of him. Okay. So now what do we do with that, right? This tiny little bit that we're aware. We seek, we search. <laughs> 